Elementals got quite the rework in Tears of the Kingdom. With many ways you can enhance their effects, add bonus damage with different fuses, and counter enemies' specific weaknesses. There's a lot of hidden stats here at play, so we plan to reveal everything about these elementals and how they work. Starting with their contact damage, which is the initial damage an enemy receives when getting the effect. In most cases, it's 10 for fire, 10 for ice, and 20 for shock. This damage does not apply if the enemy is currently experiencing that effect, only when they are brought to it. So no need to spam things like shock or ice for damage, as it's not dealing more. But fire on the other hand can be more effective when continuous, as constant sources roast an enemy for 30 damage per second on top of the fire's initial 10. So if roasting an enemy for 3 seconds will deal out 100 damage, 10 for the initial, and 90 for the 3 seconds of continuous flame. This is referred to as the fire's burning effect, which ticks down health 6 times per second at a rate of 5 damage per tick, aka 30 damage per second. This burning only happens under continuous flame like flamethrowers or burning grass, whereas direct applications like weapons and throwing fruits only deals the initial damage plus one singular tick, so 10 plus 5 in most cases. Luckily, these flames can be enhanced with the use of pine cones, which double all the fire's damage stats, so 20 for the initial contact and 10 for the tick damage, equating to 60 damage per second while burning. This makes fires extremely potent for combat, and even allows you to use it while it's raining. But sadly, there is a bit of a counter here. About half of the major enemies in this game are secretly fire resistant, and take reduced damage all around. The soldier constructs are the most affected by this, as instead of the 10 initial and 5 tick damage, they instead take 3 initial and 1 tick damage, aka 6 damage per second, making fire nearly useless against them. In a similar boat, all captain constructs take 3 initial and 3 tick damage, or 18 DPS, which is also shared amongst the boss bokoblins, and even the red tier of normal bokoblins. The higher tier bokoblins, starting on blue and up, take the reduced 3 initial damage, but their tick damage is the usual 5, so it's hardly a nerf. And the Gibdo types take a full 10 initial damage, but a slightly reduced tick damage at 4, or 24 DPS. Leaving us with all the other main monsters, including the Lizophos, Moblins, Horblins, and Yiga, which take the usual 10 initial, 5 tick, and all other rules apply. But moving away from fire, the ice element is far more straightforward, as it deals a set 10 initial damage, while the shatter out of it multiplies your attack by 3 times. Unlike other elemental damage, this shatter damage does stack with other buffs or criticals, making it the highest for damaging potential. There is also a 30 second long freeze period for most enemies, so it's a great way of controlling a combat situation. The only sort of weird weakness with ice is against Gibdos, where shattering one does not give you a damage boost. It just deals the regular amount, despite the visual effect. The final of the big three elements is Shock, which deals the highest initial damage of 20. This applies to any normal attack and also the Shock orbs. But sadly, unlike Breath of the Wild's orbs, which you could chain together for huge amounts of damage, in Tears of the Kingdom, the damage only applies once per Shock, so it's sadly no longer a working tactic. However, one big form of shock increase came in the form of Lightning, which is now programmed to one-shot any normal enemy in its blast, as opposed to Breath of the Wild, where the damage is extremely minor unless the metallic weapon is struck directly. So in tiers, the shock a player outputs with materials and weapons may be some of the weakest now, but the shock that you can control is the most formidable. Before we get into the new elements, there's another layer of elemental damage that adds on depending on the source. If you use one of the fruits or emitters to deal an effect, it's going to work exactly how we stated previously. But if you use the Chew Jelly specifically, on top of their bigger splash, it deals an additional 10 magic damage, which is unaffected by any buff or nerf, and can even be dealt if the enemy isn't usually weak to that element, including bosses. The exception being enemies that match that element, who take none. It can even damage in rapid succession, unlike the initial elemental power, which requires the effect to wear off first. And fortunately, this 10 extra magic damage is just the low end, as most other elemental materials like horns, wings, and eyes deal 20 magic damage per use, so you can still get good merits out with rapid combos. This bonus only applies when used as a projectile though, like bows and throwing, whereas most melee weapons are exempt from it. By far the most potent materials are the gems, which deal out a huge 80 damage magic area effect attack, on top of their elemental damage and effect. These are expensive, but since the damage can be applied in rapid succession, you can combine this with a 5-shot bow for a massive 400 damage blast, plus the element, for just the cost of one gem. It's quite overpowered. 
Sadly, this is heavily nerfed against the Gleox, as only a direct head hits will deal the gem damage, with the area of effect blast being ignored by the other heads. But speaking of these guys, they really are the king of the three elements, so how do these powers work against them? Typically, most other bosses are immune to the elements, including the initial 10 or 20 damage they dish out, which is still true with the Gleox. But the unique quirk about them is attacking their head with an opposing element will double the damage of that full attack. So a 64 damage bow shot with a fire property will deal 64 damage to a shock or fire head, but 128 damage to an ice head. And for the record, a base Gleox head has 100 health, while King Gleox head has 150, so this extra damage is crucial. Just know that this elemental double damage applies strictly to the health of a head, but not the main health bar of the Gleok. This means that elemental attacks won't do you much good when the Gleok is down, since you're only breaking down the Gleok's main health bar. In short, always try to take down the fire and ice heads with the opposing elements for a huge boost, then just use your highest number weapons with max buffs for the down heads. And after you kill them, their elemental horns are awesome for extended weapon use, as these parts uniquely never lose charge. This is compared to most other elemental weapons, which go on cooldown every 4 swings or spins, or 5 for the spears, which you'll have to wait 5 seconds with no swinging for a recharge. Oh, and I can't wrap up talk about the 3 man elements without mentioning their corresponding armors, which simply dish out their elemental's initial damage and effect, plus 5 physical damage, so typically 15 or 25 for shock. The level of the buff only affects the radius of the blast, and that's it. But let's move on to the game's biggest new element, Water. Unlike the others which have initial contact damage, Water doesn't get one. Even the magic damage stat for things like Chew Jellies and King Scales is zero, with the only exception being Opals and their 10 damage blasts, I assume for being somewhat explosive. The only initial damage Water can deal is against the Gibdos, which is uniquely 10, same for the previous three elements. But clearly, damage is not what Water is meant for, as it's more so meant to clear sludge, keep your body temperature cool in hot areas, and also put out fires. Which actually leads to one unique interaction Water has. When used against a fire enemy, the attack is multiplied by 1.5 times damage. This works just like how it does for the Gleok heads, and can even deal the same damage increase to those. However, it's not super practical, considering ice is far better against fire enemies in every single way, but still need to be considered. There's quite a few other applications involving water, especially with Sidon's ability, but if you want more info on that, we made a whole separate video on the topic which has quite a few surprises. But lastly, the final element that Tears adds is the Power of Light, which is less of a damager, but is great for stunning. The duration of a stun is mostly dependent on the enemy's type, but most types get a long 4 second stun, like Macoblins and Constructs, while some others get a half 2 second stun, like the Lizalfos and Moblins. The Dazzle Fruit is the easiest way to do this, but the mirrors can hold the stun indefinitely if the beam's constant. And as long as you aren't in the shade, the light beam is active all the way till 10pm at night, and you can use it again as early as 3am, so it really does stretch the limits. This is interesting, but light can be more effective when used against the undead, as it instantly kills skeletons and can even hurt Gibdos too. You won't damage them with a quick attack like a Dazzle Fruit, but only through continuous light, taking increasing damage by the second. Starting at 3 damage ticks, it goes up by multiples of 3 each second it stays in. These ticks happen once per second, so it'll take 6 of them to finish off a base Gibdo with 60 HP, or 5 for a Moth Gibdo with 40 HP. The Queen of the Gibdos also takes damage to light, but it works much more differently, with the 10 damage initial light hit, and a constant 3 tick damage, which does not increase like the other Gibdos, and ticks down 5 times every 2 seconds. In fact, the Queen Gibdo also has an elemental weakness to the other elements too, that being 25 initial damage from either fire, ice, shock, or water. Gibdos just really are some of the uniquest when it comes to these. There is also some unique stats when it comes to Regis Lightning and the Queen, but that's again covered in our Sage Stats video, which I highly recommend. But for this final section, we are going to talk about the game's unique elemental weapons, starting with the rods. Each of them dish out their elemental's initial damage on top of the gem's unique damage stat. For rubies, it'll be plus 6 damage per ball, shock is plus 5 per ball, sapphire is plus 4 for the wave, and the opal orbs are plus 3. These can be applied over and over again for damage, and can even be buffed with attack up, but the initial damage only applies each time the enemy gets elemented. This is just the base though, because when pairing gems with the magic rod specifically, 
Not only does it triple the amount of orbs, but it also doubles the damage of each one too. So 12 damage for each fireball instead of 6, which has much more potential. The only one that's obviously different is the Ice Rod, which only has one big damaging wave per swing, but it's the effect that still makes it the most overpowered one. The only other weapon type that has unique elemental characteristics are the 8 volt long blades, which typically just dish out a 10 damage beam on top of whatever the weapon's attack modifier is, so up to 20 damage with an attack 10 modifier. This can also stack with an attack up buff, so as high as 30 damage with a max buff. Fortunately, this can go even higher, as the damage stat of the fuse material is added to the beam's damage, so a 31 damage attachments plus the attack 10 add to 41 which becomes 43 due to the hidden two-handed running rule, added with the wind's base 10 to become a 53 damage beam, which can also be added with the level 3 attack buff to become 79 damage. Now all this is great, but if the attachment is an elemental specifically, it changes just one thing about this equation, adding the material's magic damage to the very end, which will be 20 with the elemental blade fuses. Oddly enough, the actual element type doesn't change the damage here, as the element's initial contact damage is ignored for this attack uniquely, but at least its effect still applies. It's unique in this way, but it's still a fun way to elevate your blades. But anyways, thank you all for watching this episode of Stats of the Kingdom. Let me know what other topics you'll like to see uncovered next, as the research into this game has been going awesomely. A shout out to the Tears of the Kingdom data and research community who has been helping greatly with the series, and I'll link to some of their resources down below. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one. Goodbye.